If you've ever read Gabriel Garcia Marquez's A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings, then you're probably a little confused, yes? Don't worry, this story is deliberately driven by ambiguity. I mean, what are we to make of this weird, strange, indecipherable winged old man who, after enduring abuse and exploitation, flies off as suddenly as he appeared? When you analyze the story and start to make meaning of it, it's really remarkable how Garcia Marquez takes the most unidentifiable and unusual circumstances to make a very relevant point about every single one of us. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the channel so that you can continue to get free analyses on classic literature and help with writing and rhetoric by me, Dr. Whitney Costers. Now the title of the story tells us that this is about a very old man with enormous wings. Notice that the title is not called a very old angel with enormous wings. But when the old woman who knows everything about life and death proclaims that this creature is in fact an angel, it's accepted without question by the community. They believe that he's an angel of death, and there are markers of death surrounding the circumstances of the creature's arrival. I mean, Paleo is killing crabs. It's believed that his child is sick from the stench of all of the dead crabs. The world has been sad since Tuesday, and it's so dark out in the afternoon that Paleo has a hard time making out the old man who's lying in his courtyard. But really, there's no indication that he's a fallen angel or an angel of death. If anything, he's a fallen angel in the most literal sense, in that he's fallen from the sky. I mean, we're guessing he fell from the sky, but we don't even know that for a fact. Treating him as an angel of death merely allows for otherness and exploitation. And just like that, the creature is locked up in the chicken coop, gawked at, poked at, branded, turned into a sideshow, and expected to perform miracles. So there are a couple of things that we need to address here. First, if a being that you believed to be an angel suddenly fell into your backyard, even if you believed it were an angel of death, remember, he's still a divine creature sent by God, what would you do? And more importantly, how would you treat it, especially if you are religious, as the villagers, the priest, and the church are? Would you treat it with such a reverence? Would you try to make money off of it and exploit it, expect it to serve you, harm or kill it? The villagers are ignorant, provincial, and superstitious, and base their treatment of the creature exclusively on their ideas and definition of an angel. Simply put, the creature is really not an angel when measured by the villager's standard definition of what one is. So when I teach this story in my classes, I always work with the students to put together a list of descriptors that we have of angels and how we identify them. My students associate halos, protection, the color white, peace, beauty, goodness, and righteousness with angels. Basically, they think of like a precious moments figurine. And this is likely what you connect with divine creatures too, because these are common associations with angels in today's popular consciousness. But most of my students are stunned to learn that angels are not here to protect or serve people. They are God's messengers and nothing more. The word angel literally translates into messenger. In the Bible, angels are usually described as unsexed creatures without wings who communicate messages that are both good and bad in nature. They don't sing, they don't have halos, and they're certainly not perfect or angelic. And to make it even stranger, some heavenly creatures in the Bible, like the cherubim, are described as having four faces, one of a man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle, and four wings with the hands of a man underneath and calves' feet that sparkle like the color of burnished brass. Cool, right? But it gets even cooler, weirder. They ride on God's mobile throne, a throne that is covered in eyes, and they themselves are full of eyes in their backs, hands, and wings. What I'm getting at is this widely accepted popular conception of divine creatures stands in stark contrast to their appearance, purpose, and description in the authoritative text, the Bible. And yet the villagers, the priests, and even Rome are so caught up in their narrow-minded definition of a divine creature that they can't see beyond it. Consequently, this creature is punished for not meeting their expectations of an angel. He's ugly, dirty, weak, bald, clumsy, filled with parasites, and pitiful. He's found face down in the mud and struggles to get up. He's certainly not awe-inspiring. In fact, the representative of the church, Father Gonzaga, says nothing about the old man measures up to the proud dignity of angels. 
Nevertheless, the villagers falsely expect the angel to perform miracles for them, treating him as though he's a circus act. But they're disappointed that all that happens are these bizarre circumstances that don't help them, like when the leper sprouts sunflowers in his sores. They're disappointed because this isn't what they wanted. But remember, God works in mysterious ways, and sometimes things happen to us in life that seem useless, challenging, and incomprehensible. But who are we to question it, and how do we know that these changes aren't blessings in disguise? The thing about the villagers is that they're not really seeking true Christian needs. They don't really want to know God because all they're doing is commodifying the divine for self-serving purposes. To further illustrate the villagers' narrow-mindedness, the priest ironically suspects the angel is an imposter on the grounds that he does not speak the language of God, which means he doesn't speak Latin. But a priest of all people should know that Latin wasn't even a language adopted by the church until the fourth century. It's a language that humans have imposed on religion. And I do think that this story ridicules the church, its bureaucratical nature, and the almost satirical ways by which it tries to determine the nature of this creature and its disinterest in him. More importantly, though, and what the church and Father Gonzaga miss is if this creature is in fact an angel, then it's unsurprising that he's incomprehensible to humankind. The villagers are frustrated that the angel is unintelligible, speaking in some sort of hermetic language and Norwegian sailor speak. I mean, think about the difference between the old man and the spider woman. They're both strange and mysterious, but the major difference is that the spider woman communicates. We know how she transformed into a spider. She's less mysterious and more of a curiosity. But the old man isn't forthcoming and remains a central problem of interpretation. And this is one of the major themes of the story. In this case, we're confronted with a more theological or philosophical circumstance. If this mysterious being is an angel in the proper sense, then his only function is to send a message for God. And one of the messages, I think, is to convey that in the grand scheme of things, God is mysterious, incomprehensible. He can't be understood no matter how much we try to make sense of him. We are limited humans who must use finite human concepts by which to evaluate him. We can only know him by projecting our own beliefs and ideas on him and what we believe his role is in our lives. And he may not give you what you pray for or ask for. Ever heard the phrase, God works in mysterious ways? Think about how utterly enigmatic this old man is. We in the village ask the same questions about him that we do about God. Why is he here? Why is this happening to us? What is his purpose and how should I interpret him? How can he help me? Where did he go? What sort of meaning does he have for me, the village, the world? And what are we to make of all of this? Let's switch gears and look at another theme of the story by returning to the villagers inability to understand the old man. How is this relevant to us? Just because you don't understand someone or their language doesn't mean that they're incomprehensible, weird, stupid, or lesser than you. It simply means you don't know their language. So think about all the people, groups, communities who have been mistreated, dismissed, abused, exploited, and othered strictly because they are different, misunderstood, or incomprehensible to another group who believes that they are right or better. As weird, strange, and exasperating as this old man is, he is so many of us. This story is less about the old man and more about the community's reaction. It's a lesson on how not to behave. Notably, the man doesn't fight back, correct them, concede, or actively teach the villagers anything about himself. He's there, and then he leaves. On the surface, it seems like a pretty pointless appearance, but it's a circumstance that reflects people's tendency to be prejudiced, ignorant, discriminatory, selfish, exploitative, and narrow-minded. And the thing is, I don't think the villages are evil by nature. Quite the opposite, actually. And I think that that's the point. If this community were naturally cruel, then we could easily dismiss their behavior as appropriate for malicious people. And you, as a reader, could too easily say, well, that's not me. I'm a decent human. I've got nothing to learn from this story. But these are seemingly good people who are motivated by superstition and the excitement of someone new and the presence of God, something they see as a major opportunity. The divine is here, and I'm sure that many of us would ask for a miracle if God were literally before us. You know, like, please help my sick relative, bless my children, or end the violence in the world. 
And that's not a bad thing, but how far would you go to ask for these things? And what would you do if you didn't get them? In the story, the worst in people is brought out. We're told even the most merciful threw stones at the old man trying to get him to rise. As unlikable as the community is, they are us in some way or another. Unfortunately, we've probably all treated someone less than kindly because they're different. We're probably all guilty of othering someone else, which means we find a way to identify them as not us and then judge them for their differences. Remember, we don't actually know if this creature is an angel. It's just that the old lady says he is. By confidently identifying the old man as an angel, the old lady gives the villagers a context to other the old man, define him, and justify their terrible behavior. In other words, it gives them a system of values by which the old man can be measured and found at fault. As humans, I think that we have this great need to categorize and define because it makes things easier to understand and deal with. Keep in mind that the narrator tells us that the angel was the only one who didn't partake in his own act. Have you ever had a stereotype of a group of people or a certain type of person and then been annoyed or bemused by the fact that they don't meet that stereotype? It says more about you than it does about the person being stereotyped. And I think that that's what Garcia Marquez might be trying to point out. I hope that this lecture helped clarify this very strange story for you and make it relevant to your life. I really do believe that literature becomes most meaningful to us when we can identify with it, empathize with it, and see its relevance to us. And hopefully this interpretation has helped do that just for you. Please be sure to join me in future lectures and check out the other lectures that I've already posted for more analyses of a variety of canonical works. Thanks for joining me and I will see you guys next time.